Yo, what is going on, everyone? My name is Nick, or The Notorious Fantasy, and in today's video, we're going to be talking about five players who will win you your fantasy league in 2024 fantasy football. We're going to be going in-depth through five players that I believe have the upside to take you over the top and win you your fantasy league this year. But before we could get into things, I would like to ask that if you guys are new to the channel and you do end up enjoying today's video, that you please make sure to hit that subscribe button down below. And while you're down there, whether you are new to the channel or not, please make sure that you leave a like on today's video. It would help me out a ton. If you want to follow me on Twitter or X, please do so at NotoriousFNTSY. So without further ado, let's get into five players who will win you your fantasy league in 2024. We'll begin with the first player that will help you win your fantasy league in 2024, and that is Wiki Wiki DJ Moore, wide receiver of the Chicago Bears, current underdog fantasy ADP wide receiver 21 at pick 29, aggregate ADP from Fantrax, Sleeper, ESPN, MFL, and NFFC have him at pick number 31. Now, DJ Moore is a very polarizing player for this season. There are a lot of people that are worried not just about Caleb Williams play and there are a lot of people that worry that Caleb Williams is not going to live up to the hype that a lot of people gave him entering into the NFL draft and the hype that has been surrounding Caleb Williams for the last couple of years. And there are also people that are worried about the fact that DJ Moore is in a crowded wide receiver room, right? They draft Roma Dunze and they bring in Keenan Allen. And while I am a fan of both Keenan Allen and Roma Dunze and think those are two very talented players, I think when push comes to shove at the end of the day DJ Moore is the clear number one wide receiver on this team we saw DJ Moore absolutely destroy defenses last season with Tyson Bajant and Justin Fields under center DJ Moore was the wide receiver six in PPR and the wide receiver nine in PPR points per game. I understand that the addition of Keenan Allen and Roma Dunze may put some fear into the eyes of many, but in my opinion, I am not worried because I really do believe that DJ Moore is the clear wide receiver number one on this team, and I get that those other guys are better competition compared to Darnell Mooney and Equiminius St. Brown, but at the end of the day, DJ Moore is the best wide receiver on this team, and at the end of the day, while people will throw all these stones at Caleb Williams, he is better than Tyson Bajant and Justin Fields. 17 games played last year for DJ Moore, 136 targets, 8 per game, number 14 at wide receiver, 96 receptions, 5.6 per game, number 12, 1,364 receiving yards, 80.2 per game, number 6, and 9 total touchdowns, 10th, despite having just a 6.9 target accuracy, 35th at the wide receiver position, he ranked 4th in dominator rating and 8th in contested catch percentage. DJ Moore has always been a player when he was in Carolina that was heavily sought after. This was a guy that you could see on tape when you watched the games, when you whipped out the microscope and inspected things, was a guy that was always able to get open. He was a guy that was basically bent over a table by the quarterback play in Carolina. Then he gets to Chicago and we have these high hopes for Justin Fields entering into last year and Justin Fields gets hurt. We see Tyson Bajan and Justin Fields doesn't look all that great. But hey, despite the fact that the quarterback play was not very good last year, DJ Moore was still able to elevate to a top 10 wide receiver in terms of PPR points per game. Again, wide receiver nine in points per game and wide receiver six in PPR overall. I understand the concerns of Keenan Allen, Roma Dunze coming in, but I want you guys to understand that Keenan Allen is one year older. I don't think Keenan Allen's going to magically fall off the edge of the earth, Christopher Columbus style, but I also believe that Keenan Allen might not even be in on two wide receiver sets as we get deeper and deeper into the season, and Roma Dunze is able to get more chemistry 
with Caleb Williams and is able to move further up in this offense. So DJ Moore was a guy that dominated last year, 50 Shades of Grey style, and I believe he is going to dominate yet again. And coming off the board as the wide receiver 21, he feels to me like he is egregiously mispriced. It appears to me at that ADP that people think that Caleb Williams is a certified bum, right? They see nothing in Caleb Williams. They think Caleb Williams is worse than Justin Fields and Tyson Bajan combined, right? Either that or they think that Keenan Allen's going to come in here and get 200 fucking targets. Because that is the only reason why he should be coming off the board as the wide receiver 21. I think he will be a top 12 wide receiver this year with top Five upside at number two we got Anthony Richardson now Anthony Richardson is another player just like DJ Moore that is very polarizing because if you drafted Anthony Richardson last season when he was playing he was unreal Anthony Richardson was winning you games putting your fantasy football team on his back Darren Sharper hold my dick right Anthony Richardson was on top of the world, but the problem was, was that Anthony Richardson was barely ever healthy, and while you got him at a large discount last year, you found him in the fucking bargain bin, this season, if you draft Anthony Richardson, you have to draft him as a top five, top six quarterback in most leagues. Underdog Fantasy have, has him right now as the quarterback five in ADP at pick 57.4, aggregate ADP pick 59. And while I understand there is some injury concern when it comes to Anthony Richardson, and while I will make it very clear that I'm as much of a doctor as Johnny Sins, the upside for me greatly outweighs the risk. Because we saw last season, when this guy is healthy, he can rush for a touchdown plus any game. It wouldn't be surprising if there were multiple games this year where he rushed for two plus touchdowns, even with Jonathan Taylor on the team. Four games played last year, and those weren't even really four games because he was getting hurt like halfway into the game. He had four rushing touchdowns. So he was averaging one rushing touchdown per game. He missed one game with a concussion and then missed the rest of the season after sustaining an AC sprain in week five up against the Titans, a game where he got hurt relatively early in, which impacted his per game stats. He was a top four quarterback. Two of four games. Now I get the injury concern is somewhat of a worry, but the way I draft in fantasy football and the way you guys should be drafting in fantasy football, sure, Early on, the first couple of rounds, try to be as safe as possible, right? You don't need to take crazy risks for no reason, right? Wrap that condom, wrap that Trojan, wrap that Durex, that lamb skin around your team, right? But then, as you get deeper and deeper into the draft, once you start to get to the middle rounds, kind of where Anthony Richardson is going, I think you need to rip the rubber off, right? And get a little bit risky, right? I think that while Anthony Richardson is very risky. We saw the clear upside last year. We know how important rushing quarterbacks are in fantasy football. There's a reason why people say the Konami code quarterbacks, right? Why the rushing quarterbacks break fantasy football. And it's very simple. In a lot of the leagues you guys will play in, it is four points for a passing touchdown and six points for a rushing touchdown. And even if you are in a league that is six point passing touchdown, six point rushing touchdown, where it kind of tries to balance the rushing quarterbacks, even so, in those leagues, you probably have to pass 25 yards for one point and you can rush 10 yards for one point. So, guys like Anthony Richardson, who could bust off 50 plus rushing yards every single game and get potentially half a touchdown a game. Again, he was averaging one touchdown a game, which would be amazing if he could do it again. But if he's getting 0.75 touchdowns a game on the ground, they're going to be fucking feasting Game of Thrones style at the end of the season. If you ever read one of those Game of Thrones books, George R.R. R. Martin, that big bastard who wrote those things, he goes into 
insane detail about the food that is on the table. You will know everything about the food that is there. He is probably still writing those things because he's trying to think of new ways to write about how succulent a fucking turkey leg looks, that fat bastard. But at the end of the day, and I'm only saying that because the guy hasn't finished the fucking books that we all want to read, right? Any Game of Thrones fans out there, finish writing the book, buddy, okay? But Anthony Richardson, back to the main point. Again, rushing is so important for fantasy football, and Anthony Richardson is a sneaky good passer. Now, is Anthony Richardson going to go out there and fucking slice and dice O.J. Simpson style through a defense, throwing the ball like Mahomes or Aaron Rodgers, right? No. Of course not. But you don't need him to do that. 84 pass attempts last year, 50 completions, 577 passing yards, three touchdowns at a 3.6% rate. Normal passing touchdown rate is around 5%. Is Anthony Richardson most accurate quarterback on earth? Fuck no, baby. But he's better than 3.6% and only one interception. This is a Colts team that has solid weapons. They have Michael Pittman Jr. They bring in A.D. Mitchell. They also have Josh Down, Alex Pierce, Mo Money, Mo Cox, Mo Alley Cox, Jelani Woods, Island Granson. Do they have the best wide receiver room in the NFL? Of course not. But with the upside that Anthony Richardson has, he is a guy that will win you your league in 2024 fantasy football at number three we got chris godwin wide receiver of the tampa bay buccaneers underdog fantasy adp wide receiver 36 at pick 59.1 aggregate adp pick 74 underdog fantasy is notoriously a wide receiver heavy platform the running backs are going to fall later the wide receivers come off the board early and often now Fantasy drafts have really shifted the pendulum recently. We've become, as a community, as fantasy drafters, more heavy on the wide receiver position, but underdog fantasy is even more so heavy on the wide receiver position. So Chris Godwin was a guy, you asked me about a week ago, you asked me like a fucking week ago, that's a cringe joke in the Lord's year of 2024, but you asked me uh, a couple weeks ago, I would say, Nick, I, I don't really like Chris Godwin, guys. I don't like Chris Godwin. I didn't love what I saw last year. But then I read something recently, and it got some blood flowing downstairs. It was that the team is trying to put Chris Godwin in the quote-unquote Cooper Cup role in the Buccaneers offense, meaning, in my opinion, Godwin will start moving all over the field, but will primarily work in the slot in the middle of the defense. Last year, Godwin only logged 37% of the snaps from inside compared to his around 70% range over the prior three seasons, excluding last year, right? So Chris Godwin wasn't even working in the correct space last year. They didn't put him in his spot to fucking succeed last year. And that is one of the main reasons, in my opinion, as to why he ended up having a pretty mass season. Now, Chris Godwin wasn't a complete and utter disaster. He was the wide receiver 28 in PPR, tied with Terry McLaurin, wide receiver 36 in PPR points per game, tied with McLaurin and George Pickens. But obviously, when you have a name like Chris Godwin, who prior to last year was someone that a lot of fancy players have kind of, in a way, fallen in love with, a guy that has a name that carries some weights. He had 131 targets, 7.7 per game, 18th in 17 games, 83 receptions, 4.9 per game, 15th, 1,024 receiving yards, 60.2 per game, number 23, and only three total touchdowns. He ranked second in total route wins, eighth in route win rate, 39th in target separation, and 13th in contested catch rate. So while Chris Godwin definitely disappointed last year, I think a lot of signs are pointing towards Chris Godwin having a better season, getting even more involved in this offense and getting involved in the part of the field working as the slot, which is a position that Chris Godwin has been just feasting on his whole entire career. Last year, he wasn't as successful 
and they didn't have him playing his correct role. So I think with Chris Godwin going back to the slot, he is ready to hop back in the driver's seat and absolutely torch ADP as the wide receiver 36. Worst case scenario, he probably finishes as the wide receiver 36 or the wide receiver 34, and he has the upside of being a reliable top 24 wide receiver two every single week. And I think that Baker Mayfield is a good enough quarterback to put Chris Godwin in this scenario, in the slot to where he could have an amazing year in fantasy football. I don't think Baker Mayfield needs to be like a top five quarterback for Chris Godwin, as well as Mike Evans to succeed. But obviously, Chris Godwin is the focal point of this video. So Chris Godwin, not the best last year, but if they're looking to put him in the slot more, which is where he's been successful his whole career in Tampa Bay, I think we are looking at a huge bounce back year out of Mr. Chris Godwin. At number four, we move to Evan Ingram, tight end of the Jacksonville Jaguars, underdog ADP, tight end eight at pick 77.8 aggregate ADP, pick 69. Very nice. I like shout out to Borat. Tight end two last year in PPR. Tight end four in PPR points per game tied with Marky Mark Andrews. Last year, Evan Ingram outside of the touchdown category, which you could argue is very important, was a top three tight end in all metrics, targets, receptions, and receiving yards playing in all 17 games. It is also important to understand that the Jacksonville Jaguars had a big tumble at the end of last season, right? If you guys remember back, you run back the tape, you go back to last season, and the Jaguars, for a long time, were on top of the world. This was a team that's looking like, okay, we're getting close to the playoffs, we're knocking on the door, shout out Walter White. It's like, okay, the Jaguars might have the bye. And then... Lawrence goes down, and it's like, all right, maybe the Jaguars can tread water. All right, they should at least make the playoffs, right? The weeks are going on, all right? The, the, they have to make the playoffs. They're not going to lose this last game, and then they're out of the playoffs, right? The Jaguars went from the number one seed. They were meant to, it really felt like the prophecy had them as the Prince. Trevor Lawrence was the Prince who was promised, right? They're going to be the number one team. They're going to be playing at home throughout the playoffs in the AFC, right? And then they don't even make the fucking playoffs, right? So it was this great big fall. Shout out to Humpty Dumpty off that wall, right? It was this destruction of large magnitude. Implosion. Everything went wrong. It's like if you've ever seen one of those buildings that just gets blown up because like the hotel, they're done with it like in Las Vegas when they get rid of a hotel and it just completely crumples down. That's exactly... What happened to the Jaguars? And still, Evan Ingram, despite all the trials and tribulations the Jaguars went through, Ingram was still able to be one of the best tight ends in fantasy. He had 143 targets, 8.4 per game, number one at tight end. 114 receptions, 6.7 per game, number one at tight end. 963 receiving yards, 56.6 per game, number three. And four total touchdowns, 12th at tight end. In terms of efficiency, fourth in target accuracy, ninth in yards per route run, fifth in yards per team pass attempt, and 10th in true catch rate, which is funny because Evan Ingram was a guy that prior to being a Jacksonville Jaguar was known for having stone hands. Butterfingers couldn't catch the ball. Like the ball could be handed to Evan Ingram, walked right up to him, matrix style. It's in slow motion coming his way. He'd have his hands around it. And then magically, five of his fingers would fall off. Three of his fingers would fall off JPP style. And it just falls out of his hands, right? Everything would go wrong in New York for Evan Ingram. But now, in Jacksonville, everything seems to be going right. And while they add Gabe Davis, and I don't know if I, why I just pronounced Gabe Davis like that. While they add Gabe Davis from Buffalo, while they bring in Brian Thomas Jr. in the draft. And I get that these are some other weapons for Trevor Lawrence. We know that Lawrence loves Evan Ingram. When the Jaguars were down bad, Evan Ingram was getting the ball. When the Jaguars are on top of the world, Evan Ingram's getting the ball. And if Evan Ingram could just magically score 
eight touchdowns instead of four or five. He could easily be the number one tight end in all of fantasy football. While I'm a big fan of Kyle Pitts, Kincaid, a lot of the guys going ahead of Evan Ingram, for me, there is a huge drop-off. Once you get past Evan Ingram and Jake Ferguson, it starts to feel like a landmine. It starts to feel like you just close your eyes and pick one and just hope that works, right? Bird box style. Blindfold. So for me, I want to go ahead and get one of these top 10 guys that I'm pretty confident in. And Evan Ingram is towards the end of that. And I think he has the upside to be the tight end number one overall and win you your league in 2024. Before we get on into the final player that's going to help you win your league in 2024, I want to give you guys a quick word from our friends and our sponsor over at Underdog Fantasy. Now, if you're new, Underdog Fantasy, we have mentioned them countless times in today's video. If you're a first time depositor using promo code Notorious, you can claim your special pick plus up to $250 using promo code Notorious or by clicking on the link in the video description. Underdog Fantasy is the best place to do fantasy football drafts this offseason. I'm going to be doing a ton of them on live stream. We already did one earlier in the week or last week. I can't remember at this point, but we're going to be doing more on live stream. These are drafts you join one versus 11. It is a uh, 12 team draft and you are in these big tournaments competing against thousands of other people. The main tournament, Best Ball Mania, has a first place price prize of over $1 million. So if you want to get your chance, if you think you're great at fantasy football or you just want to get some practice, make sure you check out Underdog Fantasy promo code Notorious. And they also have Tournaments with as low as buy-ins as three, five dollars. So make sure you guys go ahead and check Underdog Fantasy out. Link in the video description. I love them, and they help keep the lights on here, even though the lights are never on because I like recording in the dark. At number five, we got Zamir White, running back of the Las Vegas Raiders. Now I would normally give the Raiders like the huge chant, but I've been telling you guys my throat is a little messed up. Pause. My throat has been just absolutely demolished pause again ever since I was in Vegas. I don't know what happened. My brain has been permanently altered by my time in Las Vegas, but we're back here and we got to record. We got to have fun. So can't be yelling Raiders just yet, but I assume soon my voice won't be as messed up. And I think you guys could probably tell. So Zamir White running back of the Raiders Underdog ADP running back 23, pick 87.7, pick 83 over on aggregate ADP. Now, a couple of years ago, when we see a running back like Zamir White have so much success towards the end of last season, we would talk this guy up to be like a a end of the first or a early second round pick, right? You'd have to be paying insane in the membrane draft capital for Zamir White, but we have learned our lessons, right? We have been fooled. By guys like Zamir White in the past, those couple game wonders, Kenyon Drake, carry on Johnson, the list goes on, right? Where you stuck your hand in the cookie jar, you saw those big games, and the cookie jar, it stuck, right? And you can't get your hand off, you're fucking punching the wall like an angry guy at a frat, and it ain't working. Now, it can't come off, right? And then you just are fucked, right? Now you just have one hand. That's what would happen. Every year, we'd fall for these guys, but something about Zamir White feels different. The biggest difference is if Zamir White ends up being a bust to pick 87 or pick 83, it's all fine and dandy because you didn't have to pay that crazy draft capital. Now, obviously, I think Zamir White will be successful. I really do, but it's easier to cut your losses in this range, whereas if you drafted him in the second round and he bench over a table, it would have been hard. Pause, right? It would have been a hard pill to swallow, right? Last year, from weeks 1 through 14, he's chilling on the bench. He's grabbing Josh Jacobs' Gatorade, right? But once Jacobs gets hurt and the opportunity arose, White took over in a big way, right? He, grew, he had a stranglehold. He forced, choked Darth Vader style this backfield. Four out of five starts, he has over 100 all-purpose yards, and averages 3.2 targets per game. And coach Antonio Pierce has talked up Zamir White. He talked about how Zamir White could get about 200 to 300 carries. Now, in that same press conference, 
He also talks about how at any point his job could be taken by Alexander Madison. But as someone that was kind of in on the Alexander Madison Express last year, we all know that he ain't worth the dirt on the bottom of your shoe, right? Alexander Madison just ain't all that. And again, I'm not going to sit here and say that Samir White is the next Bo Jackson, right? Because he's on the Raiders, right? He's not the next Barry Sanders, the next Ladanian Thomason, the next Adrian Peterson, the next Christian McCaffrey, the next fucking B. John Robinson, even though I get B. John Robinson hasn't earned anything yet, but you get my point, right? I'm not going to sit here and just suck Zamir White dry. No diddy, right? I'm not going to do that. But what I'm going to tell you is that Zamir White's juice is worth the squeeze. That what I saw to Zamir White last year is worth the pick at pick 83. Worth the pick at pick 87.7, worth the running back 23 because his very clear upside is potentially a top 12 weekly running back. You add the skill with the fact that you know that head coach Antonio Pierce wants to run the rock. The fact that they don't have a great quarterback, Gardner Minshew, Aiden O'Connell, tells you they want to run the ball, and Antonio Pierce's philosophy is just to run the ball. We saw that very clearly towards the end of last season, and I really do believe that Samir White could be and will be a league winner this year in fantasy football. So thank you guys all so much for watching. If you didn't end up enjoying today's video, please make sure that you hit that subscribe button down below. And while you're down there, whether you are new to the channel or not, please make sure they do leave a like on today's video. It would help me out a ton. If you want to follow me on Twitter, please do so at NotoriousFNTSY. Check out one of the videos on your screen. If you haven't seen them already, I love you guys all so much. Hope you have a great one. See you soon. As always, good boy.